Thank you for attending. Um, we look forward to this presentation and all of your questions um, after the presentation is concluded. Um, so today's objectives for this presentation are we want it to be patient-centered, so we want it to be focused on um, questions and concerns that you have um, regarding menopause and the normal phases of life. We want to describe what menopause is and why it's happening. We want to discuss the symptoms. We want to talk about how long it's happening, when it's happening, how long it's going to happen, and then possibly what we can do about it, what the treatment options are, hormonal, non-hormonal, and what the safest and best options for you are. What is the definition of menopause? Um, the definition of menopause is the time in a woman's life when she stops menstruating or when her periods have concluded. The average age in the United States is around 52 years old. Um, with the average age being 52, what that means is it can start anywhere from around the age of 48 all the way to 55. Um, menopause, this transition can go on for several years which is not always the most fun several years, but it, it, it definitely can be manageable with the right um, approach with your provider. So what is menopause? Menopause is um, the when you finally end your menses. Early is considered less than 45 years old. Late is considered over 54 years old. Perimenopause is the fun part because it's the whole transition for two to 12 months leading up to that last period. During the transition, this is when hormones start to fluctuate, periods start to fluctuate, symptoms fluctuate, so much fun going on in these, uh, these months leading up to the final period. This is one of my favorite slides. Um, what are the symptoms of menopause? This is a big question that I am encountered with on a daily basis. Um, when patients come to see me, it is not uncommon to hear women complain of vasomotor symptoms. Um, it's not uncommon for we women to talk about sleep changes, mood changes, menstrual changes, uh, changes in their vagina, their urinary system, also weight changes, and uh, the seven dwarfs of menopause. Itchy, crabby, sweaty, sleepy, bloated, forgetful, and psycho. That's just a little humor on it because a lot of this is very true and rings very close to many, many people. Um, what is a hot flash? So you heard me say vasomotor symptoms in the last slide. Vasomotor symptoms are usually associated with changes in temperature. Um, and so a hot flash is um, exactly that. So it's a sudden feeling of warmth, heat that appears without reason. So it's not like you all of a sudden get really hot after you ran up the stairs. This is like you're sitting at your desk at work charting or um, on the computer, sitting on the couch watching TV, you're in the car driving, you're in the middle of a store, and all of a sudden you get this rush of warmth over your entire body. Um, it's usually focused on your neck, torso, and face. Um, sometimes it has sweating, sometimes it has redness, sometimes you don't really f have that physical um, appearance that you're having a hot flash, and there definitely can some, be some anxiety if associated with that rush of heat through your body. Um, night sweats, what's the difference between a night sweat and a hot flash? literally just the time of day. So a hot flash can be at any time. Night sweats tend to be just in the evening, um, which happen to be timed so perfect with when you're trying to sleep or when you are asleep. Night sweats, same, same symptom. You get that rush of heat through your body, specifically on the upper part of your body, torso, neck, face. Um, and it often is so intense that it can wake you up from your sleep. Um, these hot flashes or night sweats usually tend to be less than 10 minutes. Um, could be as short as two minutes, but definitely can interfere um, with your sleep, wake you up, um, which again, doesn't help anybody the next day. Is it hot in here? Um, 
this is a perfect picture of what women can feel like with a hot flash. Um, literally, like your face is on fire, your head's on fire, your upper body is on fire. Um, it is quick and it does resolve fairly quickly, but it can be very uncomfortable and it can impact your um, it can impact your life for sure, your day. Um, these are all symptoms that you should be comfortable talking with your provider. Um, a lot of people are like, oh, it's just a hot flash. I'm not gonna talk about it. It's something I can just deal with. But there are lots, and we'll talk later in the presentation about treatments and hormone therapy. Um, but these are things that you should be comfortable discussing with your provider um, and talking with a provider that's educated on menopause symptoms and treatment, because this is not something that has to be dealt with. It's not something that you kind of have to push through and, and persevere through, that these are manageable with the, right, um, with the right options for you. So talk to your provider. Why are these things happening? What is causing this hot flash? Um, what we know as women age, they, there's a change in their estrogen. Um, as estrogen decreases, this triggers um, a part of the brain called the hypothalamus, which essentially is our thermostat. Our thermostat um, tells the body it's super warm. So that's when you get this rush of warmth, causes sweatiness. Um, it does sometimes cause anxiety, but mainly the physical part is that sweatiness, um, the heat. Um, and then with sweat, then comes chills because then you're instantly cooled off and then you feel cold all of a sudden. Um, this is exactly what a hot flash is. Not comfortable, sometimes very um, impactful, especially if it's a night sweat because sometimes you'll soak through your clothes in the middle of the day, all of a sudden you're kind of drenched, your, your, the top of your shirt is wet. So it can definitely be impactful on your activities of daily living. So make sure that if this is happening to you, this is something that you wanna to talk to your provider about. I just love the brain, so we thought we'd throw a picture in of that, but the brain controls so much of everything. It, it controls literally everything. And so hormones that change trigger different parts of our brain to signal different messages, hot flashes, anxiety, depression. Um, but why does this happen? So the next thing that I wanna think about is when does this happen and how, how often are women affected by this? So um, when you think about 80% of women experience these vasomotor symptoms during the menopause transition, that's, that's a lot. And many times it's not addressed. These are things that are sometimes either not addressed because women feel like it's either a bother or it's not and it's something they should just deal with or it's brought up and the providers aren't really um, addressing the concerns that patients have. 30% um, do report frequent or severe symptoms. That means they're impacting their life daily. Um, more than half of women in the pre-menopause, meaning before that transition has even started, report that they are already experiencing hot flashes. Um, this will increase as they go through that transition. And we know that that transition, as mentioned before, can be two to 12 months. So you're talking, you know, more than half of women experience them before the transition, and then that number just increases as you get closer to menopause. And it is most common that year, um, but definitely like, like it shows here, uh, more than half of women do experience them before that transition. How long can this last? Um, this is also a very interesting um, piece of information because what we like to think about is, oh, the trend, this, you know, this is transitional and it's temporary, um, but it's not something that's just months or even just a couple years. This can go on for seven to 10 years. So when you think about where you are in your life and then thinking about almost a decade of your life being affected by not feeling great, having hot flashes, and along with these vasomotor symptoms can also come anxiety and depression, insomnia. Um, so it is really important that we think about our quality of life and be sure that we're taking it seriously, acknowledging the changes that are real. Um, it's not something that women are making up and just making sure that we talk to providers that have the adequate information to be able to help you through this transition. Um, there is variations based on ethnicity. So I also think finding a provider that does um, very patient-centered care and individualized um, 
care for their patients is important because it's it's definitely necessary to take in all the variables when you're talking about managing somebody's quality of life. Um, onset, um, timing of onset, if you start earlier, it just means it can last longer. Are hot flashes just a nuisance or are they dangerous? Um, I think most people think that they're a nuisance, but it is important to know um, a couple things, which most people don't actually know, um, that women um, with vasomotor symptoms do have an increased risk of cardiovascular disease and depression. There's direct links with those. And as we know, cardiovascular disease is the leading cause of death in women. Um, so it's important that we be, are aware of these and that we take um, action to be able to control them and help women during this time. What are the cost of hot flashes? So physically the cost is about, you know, it says 250 to 770 per year per woman. Um, but really what is the true cost? And what I mean by that is um, if you have increased anxiety or increased, uh, increased depression, you're not sleeping well um, and you don't feel well during the day because you're having these hot flashes, what is that doing for a woman who's career oriented or you know has a career or is um, has a family? And you have to think about the quality of life and their ability to maintain function and to be able to provide care in whatever they do. So whether it's their career, their family, um, and, you know, it also is interesting because this is like, you know, around the age of 52 is when women are usually at their peak career. And so this is when women are starting to have these hormonal shifts um, and it can in impact their career as well as their family. Um, and so there's a whole, um, we could go on more about that, but we'll, we'll just say that it definitely affects women in their career and their families. And a third of these women um, have symptoms that aren't even unaddressed. Um, what is happening to my period? So as we talked about, usually the transition is where periods become more irregular. So they can start out usually becoming uh, shorter in cycle. So meaning instead of getting a period every 28 days, it's 21 to 27, um, but they do usually become um, heavier. That's how it starts. And then usually, and then, and then they start to get uh, more spaced out and heavier. Um, Everybody's different, so it's hard to know exactly what your body is going to do. So again, these all these changes are things that you want to address with your provider um, at your visits. Why can't I sleep? So as we just talked about, estrogen levels fluctuate, um, and so that can create some insomnia. Also, the hot flashes can cause some insomnia. Um, Thirty. 40% of women that experience this also have an increased risk of depression. Insomnia doesn't necessarily have to be not staying asleep, but it can be difficulty falling asleep um, or just waking up really early, so not getting your normal cycle of sleep. Um, and, and this insomnia can happen with or without night sweats. Definitely probably worse with the night sweats. Um, insomnia can also lead to depression and um, anxiety. Uh, women are at a much higher risk of anxiety or depression during this transition from um, into menopause. Um, again, estrogen triggers the brain. Um, and as we know, this increases your vulnerability and depression during this time. Why do I, what is going on with my vagina? This is, a, this is also a very common concern or complaint that I see very regularly. Um, and the slide that you're seeing is probably one of the best pictures that can actually physically kind of depict the changes. So if on the left, uh, prior to menopause, this is when the vaginal tissue is plump, um, has more texture and rugae to the vagina. There's um, more lubrication. Um, on the right, after menopause, you can see that the vaginal structure has decreased. The introitus is more narrow. Um, the skin becomes really thin. There is a drying effect. This 70% um, of women have vaginal changes that are problematic, um, but not permanent. So these things can be addressed. And later in the presentation, we'll talk about those treatments. Um, 
but usually as the vaginal tissue changes, it gets worse with time. Um, so, and it's not just the vagina, it's the, all the, it's the vulva, it's the clitoris, it's the urethra, there's lots of changes. Um, so again, these things um, can be easily addressed at your visit with your provider. So when you think about the vaginal changes, um, it's really easy to think about what that means for sex um, or intercourse. And it usually means that it becomes more painful. With decreased architecture um, related to the decrease in estrogen, um, it affects uh, the vulva, the vagina, and the genitourinary system. And so this is called genitourinary syndrome of menopause. Um, it's it's a, essentially a syndrome that includes everything we just kind of talked about with the vaginal and um, urinary changes. This is why um, women do have painful intercourse, and it is probably the most common complaint that we see in our office. Um, it can be during the transition or after, um, and this can also, it's not just the physical stuff, but it can lead to decreased libido or arousal um, or responsiveness. Um, why am I having issues with urination? Kind of the same thing. This genitourinary syndrome of menopause also affects the bladder and the urethra. The cells of the bladder are thinner, they're smaller, they're less elastic. Um, all of this can increase uh, urinary frequency, urinary urgency. It, sometimes it can also lead to incontinence because it's not as um, elastic. Um, this can happen in women that are going through the transition or after, so it doesn't necessarily have to be just once you've lost your period. What is going on with my weight? Another thing that a lot of women will complain about is, as I'm getting older, I'm gaining weight. Why is that happening? Again, uh, the good old hormone of estrogen, as it changes, um, women tend to gain a little bit of weight. Um, usually it's before their period and then right after their period ends. Um, not only are they gaining a little bit of weight, but the weight changes. So they tend to increase the amount of fat that their body has, but they're, it's because they're also losing muscle. Um, and with the fat that they're gaining, it tends to be more in the abdomen, so the midsection, which we all know um, increases the risk of cardiovascular disease. Um, usually women uh, have that weight gain at the beginning and during the transition and maybe for the couple years in the beginning, but usually around 60 or 70 years old, they'll start to be able to lose that weight again. What about my bones? Um, so many women have bone loss during this um, menopausal time and it's due to the, the decrease in estrogen. This is not a symptom though that you see. It's not like all of a sudden you're gonna go from being 5'6 to 5'4. Um, it's not all of a sudden that you have bone pain. It's kind of a hidden symptom. Um, and 50% of the women postmenopausal will at some point experience a bone fracture because of osteoporosis. So what do we do about this? Hormone therapy is okay. Hormone therapy, HT, is the new hormone replacement therapy, which was also known as HRT. Um, it's the most effective treatment for hot flashes and the genitourinary syndrome of menopause. It prevents bone loss, it decreases the risk of fractures, but it's not all the same. I'm gonna turn the mic over to Dr. Brenda Price now, and she's gonna talk more about the treatments and, um, treatment options and go into more detail about hormone therapy with you all. Thanks again for listening and here's Dr. Price. Thank you. So as Paige said, hormone therapy is okay. We need to talk about it for lot and lots of reasons and there are lots of nuances to this, but really the bottom line is let's talk about hormones because that's what we need to do. We, the term hormone therapy has replaced hormone replacement therapy because we don't want to think of it as a replacing something we've lost. We want to think of it more as a supplement, more as a medication like other medications that we use for other conditions. But I thought hormones cause cancer. Actually, really the risk of breast cancer in hormone therapy is very, very low. 
The study that scared everybody, that was called the Women's Health Initiative, first of all, that was very old data. It was published in 2004. That showed, study showed an increased rate of hormone therapy of 0.8% in the women on therapy versus the women on placebo. Let's give that a little perspective. Just by owning breasts, we all have a one in eight risk of developing breast cancer in our lifetime by the time we are at age 80, which calculates out to be about 12% risk in our lifetime. The increase of com combination hormone therapy increased that by 0.8%. So we go from 12 to 12.8. That is the same increase of risk as things like having two alcoholic beverages a day, having increased weight, maybe low physical activity. So those are things we can control that may decrease our risk of breast cancer and still say, okay, maybe hormones are okay. But what if I have breast cancer in my family? There's no additional risk of being on hormone therapy if you do have a family history of breast cancer. And it is even okay in women with increased risk due to genetics, such as the BRCA gene or the BRCA gene. But this is a very specific risk. And you need to talk to your provider about that. And you need to talk to a provider that understands these risks. What about other cancer risks? Actually, hormone therapy has been shown to decrease rates of colon cancer. Um, and it decreased the rate of colon cancer and the mortality from colon cancer. It also is neutral on lung cancer and other types of cancers. Um, and so it's not this terrible thing that causes cancer and why shan't we talk about it? What about my heart risk? Actually, hormone therapy reduces the risk of cardiovascular heart disease in women if you start at less than age 60 or within 10 years of menopause. It also decreased all-cause mortality for all women because we know heart disease is the leading cause of death in women overall. But the most important thing to say is not all hormone therapy is the same. There are different hormones that are riskier than others, and when we use estrogen through the skin, such as patches or cream, we know it's much safer, and I'll get into that a little bit more in a minute. What if I have other medical problems, such as high blood pressure? Hormone therapy is okay, but the type of hormone matters. In fact, th uh, patches or transdermal estrogen is safer if you do have high blood pressure. What if I have high cholesterol? Hormone therapy is actually still okay, and menopause itself increases your LDL or bad cholesterol, and it changes the protective effects of HDL or your good cholesterol, and estrogen can help that balance. So that is also probably some of the overall cardiac benefits from hormones. What if I have autoimmune disease? A lot of women do struggle with autoimmune disease, such as rheumatoid arthritis, lupus, or multiple sclerosis. We think there may be a link to estrogen levels and just your overall risk for autoimmune disease, but this is pretty complicated and not where we're gonna get into that today. It's unclear if estrogen can actually help your autoimmune disease, but it is okay in these patients for menopause symptoms. No reports of harm or any increased risk for rheumatoid arthritis, and it's actually being tested as a treatment for multiple sclerosis. Am I going to gain weight from hormones? Hormone therapy actually might help decrease the menopause weight gain that Paige talked about earlier, um, and the accumulation of our all fun, fun abdominal weight. But the effect is minimal, and I don't want us to think hormones are a weight loss drug. Um, it's just good for that balance and to reverse what menopause does itself. It also reduces the diagnosis of type 2 diabetes. And in women who have diabetes, it's not contraindicated. And in fact, it may help you improve your control. Are hormones good for my bones? Yes, absolutely. Hormone therapy is the most important medication we have to preserve your bone density and shows prevention of bone loss caused from menopause and the loss of estrogen. It's not a treatment for true osteoporosis, but it can help in the prevention. And when we discontinue hormone therapy, whether that's at 50, 60, 65, you have a very rapid bone loss 
after decreasing therapy. And so that's also something to talk to your provider about. Will hormones help my memory or will it prevent de dementia? No. Hormone therapy is not recommended at any age to prevent de cognitive decline or dementia. There was a study in the Women's Health Initiative that showed there could be some link to hormones in ladies over 65 on hormone therapy. Uh, I'm sorry, in dementia and ladies over 65 on hormone therapy, but that data is still out. But we do know that our memory is better when we're sleeping. Can hormones help my mood? Yes. Hormone therapy has, has the same effects as antidepressants in depressed women in the perimenopause with or without hot flashes. But it is not shown to be treat a treatment for depression in ladies that are post-menopause. It's really that crazy transition time. It also has shown to be able to just help mood and sense of well-being in women who in perimenopause who don't have an actual true diagnosis of depression. What about compound? What about compound hormone therapy? Isn't compound better? And what is bioidentical? The problem with compound therapy in our country is that there's minimal government regulation and minimal monitoring of compounded pharmacies. And it is there is inconsistent dosing from month to month, prescription to prescription. What you're getting in April may be very different than what you're getting in May. And because of that, there could be impur impurities and a lack of sterility. So it's really not the, not recommended to do compound and therapy in a, in a pharmacy if we don't have to. And the topical progesterone cream that is used in compounded pharmacies is not absorbed well. Progesterone is not absorbed well through your skin. And it, it is in insufficient levels to protect your uterus from endometrial cancer if you are on estrogen therapy. And that is a very important distinction. And you need to understand that with a provider that understands that too. Should I get my hormones tested? Actually, it's really hard because our hormone, our hormone changes, our hormone levels fluctuate so much in this time of life that they fluctuate from day to day, hour to hour, week to week. And so sal saliva and urine testing to determine hormone levels is very unreliable and it does not offer any good clinical information. Even blood levels are hard of hormones are very rarely needed and not that helpful. The decision that I make when and where to start someone on hormone therapy and how much to do is based on symptoms and a, and a good talk, not on any lab tests. What is the term bioidentical? And doesn't that sound better? Yeah. It does, it sounds better. The term bioidentical sounds better and it is okay. All that term means is that the estrogen and progesterone that we are supplementing is, has the chemical structure identical to what we normally produce in our body. But that term has got, the bioidentical term has been used by marketing companies and it usually means compounded and not regulated. But we do have bioidentical forms of estrogen and progesterone that are FDA approved, safe and effective, both in oral and vaginal and transdermal forms of therapy. Here they are. There are some pictures. There are systemic therapy that are oral pills, skin patches, skin gels, skin sprays. These are all estradiol, which is what our body makes naturally. And then there's progesterone in the form of prometrium, which is also what our body makes naturally. And this is the most uh, true to our bodies and the best form of therapy and also the safest. How long should I take hormones? Is it, only, is it safe only for a certain number of years? And that is a very personal decision. Hormone therapy is considered safe and effective for women under 60 or less than 10 years of menopause. But can we use it longer than age 60? Yes, you can, but it needs to be a personal decision discussed with a provider that can talk to you about the true risk and benefits. We don't need to routinely discontinue at 60 or 65, but we do need to talk about the lowest effective dose and what's the best choice for each individual. What about the vagina? As Paige talked about, 
and showed you the pictures, genitourinary syndrome of menopause is probably more common in my office with complaints than hot flashes. It affects between 70 and 80% of women, and sadly, only six to 7% of postmenopausal women are treated. It progresses and worsens over time as we get farther and farther away from our natural estrogen. And we talked about the loss of estrogen leads to the direct physical changes in the labia, the vagina, and the bladder. What are treatments for the vagina? We have vaginal lubricants. They can be used prior to sexual activity to reduce friction, and there are some that are better than others. There are vaginal moisturizers that can be used regularly, several nights a week to help retain moisture. And then there's low-dose vaginal estrogen therapy, which is the most effective, and again, as I said, safe. So here's some pictures of low-dose vaginal estrogen treatment. It can be given in the form of a cream, in the form of a ring, in the form of tablets and different inserts. There are different pros and cons to each of these methods, but all of them are safe and effective and use bioidentical forms of estradiol. Are there other benefits of hormone therapy? Yes. Other than hot flashes and, and the vagina, it reduces bone loss, reduces risk of fracture, reduces new onset of diabetes, it reduces all-cause mortality in women, reduces coronary heart disease when started less than 60 or within 10 years of menopause. Estrogen alone actually reduced breast cancer rate in women less than 60. However, you can't use estrogen alone if you still own your uterus. So that's a, that's a nuance that we need to talk to your provider about. And then hormone therapy improves mood and depression, sexual function, and the genitourinary health. What if I can't? take hormone therapy, and that is true. There are some very real, very true contraindications for hormone therapy. The most uh, prevalent is cardiac disease, including cardiovascular disease, including heart disease, history of stroke, or history of uh, deep vein thrombosis or pulmonary embolus. That is a contraindication for hormone therapy. Breast cancer, especially hormone-sensitive breast cancer, history of endometrial cancer, or anyone with undiagnosed vaginal bleeding. Now, we know that vaginal bleeding can be uh, problematic in perimenopause, as Paige discussed. So that is something that you need to talk to your provider about. And if, you, if they understand the cause, then, that is, then it is OK again to talk about hormones. If I have contraindications for systemic hormones, can I still treat my vagina? Yes. Even women who have true contraindications for systemic hormone therapy can use local vaginal estrogen for the genitourinary symptoms. It can be used throughout the lifespan and it can be used safely. I have ladies in their 90s still on their hormone therapy, their vaginal hormone therapy. And today, this morning, I sent my patient with breast cancer last year with a prescription for vaginal hormone therapy. It is okay. Are there any other treatments for just my hot flashes other than hormones? Yes, there are. Um, and so for ladies with contraindications who are still really struggling with hot flashes, this is, uh, th there are options. Antidepressants do work. Uh, Paxil, Celexa, and Lexapro have been shown to be safe and effective in reducing hot flax flashes. Also, other medications, gabapentin, these are all medicines that have been shown to decrease the severity and onset of hot flashes. And interestingly, there is a new therapy that is coming soon that will affect the direct effect of hormones and the hypothalamus in the brain. That is supposed to be released in February of 2023, so coming soon. That will be to be determined. Are there other non-hormonal or non-medical options for me to help me feel better? Yes, there are herbal remedies, exercise, cognitive behavioral therapy. All of these have limited studies, unfortunately, but they do show limited effectiveness in the actual reduction of hot flashes. There are herbal remedies such as black cohosh, wild yams, evening primrose oil, different Chinese herbs. And so those are nuances to talk to your provider about and to explore. Um, exercise is so important, so important for your heart, your brain, your lungs, your mood. But there's the few studies that were done on exercise don't decrease the number or severity of hot flashes that 
that occur. Cognitive behavioral therapy has great evidence for insomnia, does not decrease the number of severity of hot flashes, but it decreases how much they bother you. So maybe that's good. These are things to talk about, again, with somebody who knows and can help you. Are there any other non-hormonal options? There is a company called Bonafide that has decent studies on non-hormonal therapy. One, uh, one uh, product is called Reverie. It is used, it's a product with hyaluronic acid and has been shown to help relieve vaginal dryness and pain with intercourse. There is another a product that they make called Relizin that is a Swedish flower pollen extract that did show studies to decrease amount of night, uh, night sweats in women. So these again are things to, that you could explore. There are some pictures. Most importantly, where do I go from here? How do I start? One wonderful resource that I learned about recently is an, a website called mymenoplan.org. It's a free website that was uh, formed by the members of the North American Menopause Society, um, and it does not support any specific product, because as we all know, if you put menopause in Google, you're gonna get a thousand things of how you can buy things and what is gonna solve your problems. And you're not gonna have any, you're not gonna have any knowledge of what's real and what's not. So mymenoplan.org does not support any specific product. As a patient, it helps you walk through your symptoms, talk about treatment options, and make it personal for you. There are hormonal and non-hormonal options. They have great data and studies about exercise, about different herbal therapies. And then what it's designed to do is have you go through this and then bring that to a provider that's educated on menopause so you can have a good conversation. So these are our references and um, I'm going to invite Paige back up here, and we're going to just entertain questions. Um, okay. All right. Thank you for the Thank presentation, you. ladies. That was very informational, Paige and Dr. Price. Um, we do have quite a few uh, questions ready to go. Okay. But we want to remind our audience that now is the time to ask more questions in the chat box below the video screen, and we'll take as many as we can tonight. Uh, some of these may have been asked before um, during your presentation and covered, but I'm still going to go through uh, what our audience has given us here. Great. Okay, great. So, um, we'll start with some of the basics here. Uh, does most insurance cover women's? Uh, menopause and these uh, questions, as well as mental health? It should. Most insurance covers well women exams up to women over uh, up to age 65. Unfortunately, Medicare, there are some nuances to Medicare coverage for well women exams, but really women up to age 65 have a covered well woman exam and it can be with a, it doesn't have to be with a primary care provider. It can be with a gynecologist, with a midwife, with somebody who is uh, educated about this and it should be covered. Okay. What was the second part of that? Uh, mental health as well. Mental health. I, I wish we had better coverage yes. for mental health in the world. Agreed. Yeah. Um, it depends. Um, that depends on insurance coverage. Um, but some of the starting points that can be covered by uh, a, a provider that is good at, good at it. Yeah, I was going to chime into that. So as we know, menopause can affect your mental health and create and cause increased anxiety and depression. That's something that you could definitely talk to your provider about at your well woman visit or at um, you know, your visit with your gynecologist for any reason. And if your provider is um, educated and feels comfortable with menopause, then that is going to be something that's easily addressed. So it doesn't have to necessarily be like a separate mental health visit. As we know, that's a part of every visit. Anytime you go in, that's something that your provider should really be assessing. And, you know, as well as all the physical stuff, mental, uh, mental health is a very important part of um, our body. Okay. At what specific point should you have your estrogen checked? Well, actually, that's the most important thing is we don't. It's not 
really important to have your estrogen levels checked because they fluctuate so wildly at, in perimenopause or menopause. Estrogen levels really aren't helpful because they could be high one day and low the next. So really, sim uh, decisions based on treatment should be based on symptoms, yes. not blood levels or any kind of lab levels. Okay, thank you. Should women with migraines expect to see an increase in them or more sensitivity to alcohol and sugars or other foods? This person is experiencing all of that. Oh, sorry. Uh, migraines can uh, get more intense during perimenopause with hormone fluctuations. Really, that depends on the migraine sufferer. Some women have really sensitive, yeah. uh, have migraines that are very sensitive to hormonal fluctuations, and those women do tend to suffer more in this time. Other women, hormones really aren't their triggers. So it really is very personal, and that depends on that person. And sometimes the right treatment can actually help that. Again, it kind of dep depends on the trigger for the migraines, um, but it's definitely like migraines are not a contraindication to hormone therapy, and a lot of times it can change for the better. So it's definitely worth mentioning that uh, to your provider um, when, the, when you're in for your visit. And that's an important distinction because we do feel that migraines may be a contraindication to birth control pills, but hormone therapy, especially when we use patches or through the skin, it, migraines are not a contraindication. Yes. And what about sensitivity to alcohol and sugar? Um, I, I mean, I think that depends on that specific person and if that's their migraine trigger. Okay. A lot of those things that were just mentioned in the last question are very specific. And so I think it would be really important if you do have um, specific concerns to find a provider that's going to be able to listen and be able to hear and address all of those concerns to be sure whatever um, treatment or therapy that is going to be prescribed is going to be the right one for you. And as we all know, sometimes things aren't perfect. It might be a trial and error. We might have to try something or adjust it, or we start at this dose and then we might have to increase or decrease based on um, how you're feeling. So I think it's important to find a provider that's going to be able to listen and that you're going to be able to work with because it's not a one size fits all. Everybody gets this medication. It's very individualized and finding a provider that's going to be willing to sit and find and really work through an individualized plan is going to be the best thing. Is increasing the dosage of estrogen or progesterone better for reducing hot flashes at night? Generally, estrogen is the most important thing to control hot flashes. Progesterone is more to balance the estrogen to protect the uterus from abnormal bleeding, um, and it, progesterone has a nice f effect on sleep. But for increased hot flashes, I usually increase the estrogen dose first. Uh, if one starts home, HRT, how long does that treatment go is it just for a transition time or forever? That's very yeah. individual. Yeah, hormone therapy should not necessarily just be stopped because you hit a certain age or you've been on it for so many years. Um, again, I think we need to treat symptoms and in, in the individual. So really being able to, to individualize these plans is the most important thing. Um, but as we know, decrease, like a sudden stop in this can affect your bones and your mental health and a lot of those things. So just because you're on it for a certain amount of time doesn't mean you have to stop it. Or a certain age. Or a certain age. So you did mention that 60 was kind of a magic number for weaning off of that. Do you wean off of it uh, gradually or can you uh, no, go into it, that? It actually used to be thought, well, 60, we have to stop. But really studies have shown that it's not a magic age. They, The cardiovascular risk is very clear, less than 60. Over 60, there could be some increased cardiovascular risks. I generally don't start a woman who's 62, 63 okay. on hormones for the very first time because I feel that that's probably not helpful for her cardiovascular risk. But if a woman is doing well at 60, she doesn't necessarily have to change on her birthday or stop on her birthday. But that is the nuance of the discussion. Okay, where are we with your bone health? Where are we with your mental health? How are you with your symptoms? Do you want to go down? And we do like to try to get women on the lowest effective dose um, because that's just the smartest thing in all of medicine. So um, those are the nuances that are discussed, but it doesn't have to be a cold stop. Um, so when it does come time to stop, it's not usually a cold stop, not just one. You talk to your provider and they help you go off of this. Yes. yes. 
Yes. Could HRT help with insomnia that started with menopause? Absolutely. Yes. Absolutely. Absolutely, yes. So remember, it's the change in estrogen that triggers those things in the brain. It's also the change in estrogen that triggers those hot flashes or the vasomotor symptoms. So if we initiate some hormone therapy to help balance out that decrease in the estrogen, that's gonna. The hope is is that that's what it. That's what it's gonna help. It's gonna decrease the vasomotor symptoms. It's gonna decrease the insomnia, um, as well as the anxiety and depression as well. But it is interesting that insomnia can be above and beyond night sweats. It's not mm -hmm. just waking up sweaty. Yeah. It's all of the processes of the brain and sleep are affected by hormones. Uh, could it help also with muscle loss? Some. Um, because of the weight distribution. As we get older, weight, you increase your fat and decrease your lean muscle mass and put fat where we don't want it, here around the middle. And so it can help that distribution. But hormones are not a weight loss drug. Hormones are not uh, muscle building. It's more to preserve what you've already had. One of the things, and again, something you would talk with your provider, but as a woman ages, because we know that they lose muscle mass and gain fat, it is important to make sure that we're, you know, taking proper supplements and vitamins as well as doing certain exercises that can help um, decrease the loss of your muscle and hopefully decrease um, decrease the, the weight gain, especially in the midsection. Um, so how should women with increased risk of breast cancer, so they don't have it yet, they just have a risk, um, mitigate the impact of menopause like bone loss, hot flashes, etc.? Well, um, when you talk about Brenda mentioned it at the very beginning. When you have hormone therapy, just because you're at an increased risk of breast cancer doesn't mean you're not a candidate for hormone therapy. So I think this is a time when you're going to go to your provider and you're going to say, look, I have this, you know, predisposition because of a genetic, um, you know, because I carry this genetic uh, disease or disorder, or my, I have a strong family history, and that's something you're going to talk about, but that doesn't necessarily mean that you're not a candidate for hormone therapy. So I think that uh, the media and society and a lot of the push with the Women's Health, Health Initiative kind of really scared a lot of women from using hormone therapy. Um, but since then, more studies have come out to show that it is really a safe modality for women to be able to um, use hormone therapy during that transition and, and even after. But it has to be an individual choice. Yep. And if a patient just is so nervous and does not want to do hormone therapy because she watched her mom and her sister and her grandma have breast cancer early, we have other uh, medications for hot flashes like uh, antidepressants and we have other medications for, uh, well, and vaginal estrogen is still okay so we can treat the vagina. Uh, but also the alternative therapies like the cognitive behavioral therapy, um, the, the like uh, more natural supplements. There's lots of things that can be used. And again, I think it's just a big conversation, uh, an important conversation that you should have with your provider. Uh, so kind of a segue to that. Um, so for natural solutions, um, for people who don't want to do HRT. Right. Uh, can you talk to that a little bit? Well, I had a couple of those treatments um, that the company called Bonafide makes some alternative um, hormonal therapy, both for vaginal health as well as for hot flashes. That is on my slide. You can look them up on their website. Um, on mymenoplan.org, it goes through both um, hormonal and non-hormonal options and really is really good. It taught, what is black cohosh? Here's the data. What is evening primrose oil? Here's the data. So it actually is better and more knowledgeable about all the different herbal therapies than I am, but it gives a lot of interesting information and that's why it's such a good resource. Yeah. There are also, especially for women that are in our community, we do have a lot of alternative therapy specialists that are out there, like um, acupuncturists, Chinese herbalists. There are many very smart, well, edu very well educated um, people in our community that can provide resources for that. Um, that are alternative, that aren't your typical uh, hormone therapy that we talked about. Um, so I do think it's important that you talk to your provider because when I have patients that come in that say, hey, I 
this is how I feel, and I go over the benefits and the risk, and then we talk, we, that's part of it, is that we talk about those alternative therapies, and it doesn't always have to be a medication or a patch or a cream. Um, those are options um, for a lot of people, but not everybody wants to take that route, and if you don't want to take that route, there's lots of resources in our community that um, we can provide that will have a different approach. Thank you. I've heard you can't start HRT after five years of entering menopause, or can it be started anytime after menopause to reduce uh, symptoms, including osteoporosis? We, we think the window is actually 10 years. Um, so the, the studies are pretty clear, less than 60 or less than 10 years from onset of menopause um, for cardiovascular risk as well as bone oh. loss. Uh, this person says, if I'm still on the pill, will I still experience the symptoms of perimenopause? Maybe not. Maybe not. It, yeah. um, it's, a good, it's a good bridge. It's a nice, um, the right pill for the right person can really help bridge that uncomfortable or um, inconvenient time of that transition, that two to 12 months. It can really help with the irregular cycles, um, the changes in the menstruation. It can, it can help with the mood changes. It can help a little bit with that. So I do always encourage people, if, if you're already on birth control and it's a good option for you, it's something to talk about your provider with your provider to continue, continue on during that time, as long as it's safe and that's something you've um, worked out with your provider. Um. Do you know of any studies or practitioners using psychedelics for symptom treatment? I don't know of those. Do yeah, you know those? I do. There are some studies that are starting to come out, but they're very early, and nothing has, has been statistically significant at this point. Um, but I think in the years to come, there might be some more data coming out on that. But right now, um, that's not really one of the things that myself or Brenda um, I would say I'm not very well educated on those, but I, I think that if it's going to be a good option and there's going to be data out there, that I hope that, that the data comes you know, to the forefront and that's something we could explore if the data is st statistically significant for showing good outcomes. This one's a little bit long, but I'll get through it here. For someone charting biomarkers, cervical mucus, BBT, LH testing, et cetera, of their menstrual cycle during perimenopause using a fertility awareness-based method, do you recommend a cyclic HT application until menopause? That's a pretty specific thing, and that needs to be kind of addressed with the provider. Um, you don't have to do that cyclically, but you can. But the problem with that type of approach in perimenopause is your body's wacky. Yeah, we don't really know. It fluctuates so much. It would be, I think it might be hard, um, but good for that person for tracking all of those things during that errat kind of erratic time. I mean, I think it's it shows dedication and really... Um, really good knowledge for your body and um, I think that's something that you should talk about with your provider because it definitely is an option but I don't know that the benefits would be that great um, only doing it cyclic. And do understand that this is a time of life where you could still ovulate. You still need some sort of birth control and unfortunately with the irregular cycles and the regular ovulation it's harder to track and harder to count on that. Uh, this person is allergic to estrogen cream, the vaginal. Um, are there other alternatives and they can't wear the patch either due to allergies? Yeah, I think there are some non-medication, um, like non-hormonal lubrications that can help for the um, for some of the vaginal symptoms. Ultimately, if the vagina is losing estrogen, the best way to fix that would be to replace it. But if there's a sensitivity or an allergy, then I would say that's something that you should talk about with your doctor or your provider. That way um, you can find the best non-hormonal uh, topical application for you. Well, but you might not be allergic to the estrogen. You might be allergic to the cream. Compound, yeah. What they're putting to make it a cream, actually, that's probably more the more likely. So there are um, little tablets that can be used vaginally to help with vaginal um, or a ring uh, or the ring. So there are definitely va 
alternatives to the cream for allergy. And then in terms of adhesives, um, I do have some people that are sensitive to certain adhesives. And so the patch is difficult, but there is estrogel, which is more of a lotion that can be used and other, other nuances so that we can still do through the skin, which is the safer form of estrogen, without a patch. Um, those are just the nuances to talk to your provider about. Okay. Uh, this person is really struggling. They've chatted with their uh, gynecologist about being in peri, uh, experiencing nearly all of the symptoms. Um, the gynecologist suggested starting birth control, but she doesn't need contraception. And she asked about hormone therapy, and the doctor said that that's only prescribed after entering full menopause. And that goes against everything she's heard. Yeah. Is that an outdated recommendation? Yeah, I would encourage her to sit down with a provider that has um, a more in-depth understanding of menopause and the symptoms and the options for hormone therapy or therapy in general. It doesn't even have to be hormonal therapy, but I would encourage um, her to sit down and explore different options. Um, and find the, find the right fit for um, having a better relationship with the provider. But there are nuances to perimenopause because if you are having really erratic, really irregular periods, sometimes the patch and the prometrium aren't enough to control that bleeding. And so I actually do very often put ladies in perimenopause back on a low-dose birth control pill and use that to make that bridge and make that tradition, uh, transition from the late 40s to the early 50s and how we can make that. So that's not ne that's not necessarily a bad recommendation. It just might not have been explained very well yeah. um, because a low-dose birth control pill, even if your husband had a vasectomy or you don't need birth control, I do that a lot. It can be a it good can be hormone really helpful. therapy to bridge that gap. But hormone therapy is not contraindicated for women in that perimenopause transition. It just really depends on what your bleeding is doing and exactly. what your specific circumstances are. What are signs and symptoms if you're taking more estrogen than is appropriate? Um, a re well, estrogen can cause breast tenderness, it can cause some nausea um, and um, headaches. And so those are symptoms that are characteristic of estrogen. And so if I have patients with those side effects, we usually try to take them down. But a lot of the nuance to this is balancing the dose of estrogen and the dose of progesterone. And so you'll bleed. And so if there's too much estrogen and not enough progesterone, you'll bleed. If there's too much progesterone, not enough estrogen, you'll bleed. So these are those things that it's not an all one size fits all. You've got to keep talking. You've got to keep coming back. You've got to fine tune it. And that's why it takes some practice. How does the marina affect menopause? Um, the marina is actually a really great tool to bri for bridging um, into menopause because it helps the dysfunctional bleeding. It helps the crazy periods. A lot of women with marinas have very light periods, if any at all. Um, and it protects the lining. It protects the endometrium. If we do add estrogen, you don't, you're not at increased risk for endometrial cancer. Um, and so there are some studies saying that actually should be the preferred method of hormone therapy is a marina and an estrogen patch. It's not systemic. It's localized. It goes right to the uterus. And so we always talk about balancing estrogen and progesterone together. Um, and that is, the Mirena is a progesterone only um, intrauterine device. And so that takes place of that needed progesterone to protect the lining to um, hopefully avoid endometrial cancer. And so it is, like Brenda was saying, it's fine tuning it. Um, but the Mirena would be a great option. There's um, another. Uh, hormonal IUD that could also help bridge the gap, but the Mirena is definitely a great option for that. So can you just take estrogen? If you have had a hysterectomy and you don't have your uterus anymore, you yes. can just take estrogen. But if you have a uterus and you just are on estrogen therapy or you're on compound and progesterone cream that's not absorbed well and not, you can get endometrial cancer. It's a very serious, important distinction. So if you have your uterus, you need estrogen and progesterone, whether it's local in an IUD or pills, Systemic. that are. but it has to be protective of the uterus. <coughs> Excuse me. And that's even if you uh, don't have a uterus, but you still have your ovaries? No. No. 
No, it's only endometrial cancer that you worry about. So it's only uterine cancer. It's only the uterus. Yeah. So if you have had your ovaries removed, um, it, it's the progesterone is important for the uterus. Um, do you recommend uh, a treatment for migraines caused by menopause? I mean, I think that could be just a normal, you know, anybody's symptom. Everybody has different symptoms that are bothering them more or not. Yeah, and if the trigger is one of the, is the cause of the hormonal shift, if the estrogen is triggering, the decrease in estrogen is triggering something, then hormone therapy could be a solution for those migraines. Again, I think it's just really individual and you'll have to talk with your provider about that. Uh, this person had a hysterectomy 14 years ago, took HRT five to six years, and have been having hot flashes since they stopped it and are now 70. Oh. They've had no luck with non-hormone treatments. Can they start it again? That's a little bit difficult because there are some discussions about restarting hormone therapy and increased risk of clot and heart risk. Um, and so, that would be a discussion to have with a provider. What did we actually explore? Did we do antidepressants? Did we do systemic things, not just not just herbal therapies, but actually other therapies that could help hot flashes? Yeah. There, are, there are therapies specifically for vasomotor symptoms that are not um, estrogen. So I think that could be a, definitely a discussion and an option if it's right for her. Um, and that's something that I would encourage her to explore with her provider. And um, one last question here. Uh, we've had a lot tonight. Uh, can one take uh, HT if a pituitary tumor is present? That is. That depends on the pituitary tumor, uh, the type of pituitary tumor, the treatments that they're on for that pituitary tumor. Um, but it's not complete contraindication, but it would be a little bit more complicated yeah, answer. Definitely would require a little more information, um, but I would have that person for sure reach out to her provider. Uh, and you guys are taking uh, clients so people can reach out to you after this. Uh, we have some frustration with current providers uh, being expressed. So I always tell people too, don't get discouraged. There's some providers that ever, we all have areas that we are more comfortable with and some people just aren't as comfortable with it. And it's not that they, I'm, I'm, I'm sure that it's not that they don't want to help you feel better or be in a better place or overcome some of these nuances of this transitional time. Um, so I just don't don't feel frustrated. But if it does feel like you're not getting the answers that you want, maybe maybe reaching out to a different provider might be a better solution. But um, some people, we all know, we're, we're all better at other things. And so um, I think most providers have good intentions. And um, I just would encourage you to follow up and find a good fit for you. Um, yeah, that's what I would say. So thank you very yes. much to Paige and Dr. Price. Um, we've come to the end of our time. A recording of tonight's lecture will be available at bch.org backslash live stream. You will receive a post-lecture survey by email. Please take a minute to fill this out. Have a good night. Thank you. Thank you.